Well, welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming uh, to tonight's panel, which is called Solving the Biodiversity Crisis, Strategic and Interdisciplinary Approaches. Now, after this panel discussion, which is going to be excellent, you go down the end of the hall, there's going to be a reception with wine and food and beer, and so um, I want you to make sure that you not only listen carefully to what these folks say, but mingle with them afterwards and talk with them some more. In any case, around the world, species and habitats are being lost at an unprecedented rate, degrading ecosystems and the life-supporting service they provide for all of us. We face the extinction of over one million animal and plant species in our lifetimes. We have to act now to solve the biodiversity crisis and navigate to a sustainable and just planet Earth. It's necessary to increase our knowledge of the natural world. It is really complicated, but we need to understand how to protect and restore the remaining intact ecosystems from our forests to our oceans. That's how we're going to be able to halt species loss, all the while monitoring and measuring our dependencies and impact on these global systems. We often hear a lot about climate change, which is of course a critical problem, but it's actually a pretty simple problem. The biodiversity problem is actually at least as bad and suffers from the problem that it's really complicated. That's why we have these experts here to explain this to us tonight. We're at a pivotal, mo pivotal moment in humanity's journey in stemming the loss of biodiversity. Like many of our sustainability challenges, leaders have to protect nature now or the consequences will be worse or more costly in the future. The collapse of biodiversity doesn't mean we face the extinction of plants and animals alone, but the collapse of our water supply, our food supply, ultimately political stability and civilization itself. The significance of biodiversity loss has long been neglected by our politics, eco economies, industries, organizations. It's now finding its place on the agenda, increasingly recognized as an issue requiring our urgent attention across all sectors of society and business. Our students and faculty have been adding biodiversity to the agenda across their classes and new classes, including reversing the biodiversity crisis, a new class this semester. Thank you all. And with our first biodiversity focused panel here at the sustainability management here at SPS in the climate school. Tonight's panel will be moderated by my colleague Wendy Hapgood. Wendy is the co-founder and COO of Wild Tomorrow, I think that sounded like my lifestyle when I was a teenager, <laughs> a wildlife conservation nonprofit dedicated to the protection, restoration, and rewilding of threatened habitats to protect biodiversity. Wild Tomorrow has successfully restored degraded farmland to create a wildlife corridor in South Africa, employing local indigenous community members to create sustainable livelihoods based on ecosystem restoration. Wendy holds a master's degree in international relations from the University of Queensland in Australia, and she also has an MS in sustainability management <laughs> from right here at <laughs> Columbia University. And she's now a member of the SUMA faculty and the Columbia School of Professional Studies, teaching courses on sustainability management and leadership. So before we go any further, let's give Wendy a round of applause. <laughs> Tonight's panelists include Dr. Amy Carpati, who is an ecologist and educator. She's worked as a conservation biologist and environmental advocate in the New Jersey Pinelands, as a science director at a nature preserve and environmental education center in New York, and as an ecological consultant on a number of projects. She is a lecturer here in the sustainability management program and teaches two courses, one called the Science of Urban Ecology and the other reversing the biodiversity crisis. She holds a PhD in ecology and evolution. We also have with us another uh, colleague of, on our faculty, Dr. Jenna Lawrence, 
who is a biodiversity specialist, having worked in the Peruvian Amazon, the Dominican Republic, Jordan, Kenya, and the Mekong region. As a Columbia Climate School lecturer, she is a faculty member in the Sustainability Management Program, the undergraduate major in Sustainable Development, and she is associated with the International Research Institute on Climate and Society, as well as the Department of Environmental Science over at Barnard College. She received her PhD right here from the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology, and uh, she is a wonderful colleague, and I hear a great teacher. <laughs> also with us is Agnes Vinblad, who is the policy lead for Climate, Biodiversity, and Environment at the United States Council for International Business, a multi-sectoral trade association with over 300 leading U.S. companies in its membership. She has represented U.S. business perspectives at several high-level multilateral uh, negotiations all across the world, serving as head of delegation to critical meetings such as the UN Biodiversity COP15. There's actually a COP related to biodiversity, and they're only at 15. They haven't gotten to 20. <laughs> She's also involved in multiple UN climate change negotiations. And last but not least with us today is Dr. Mateusz Pitkowitz, who is the founder and CEO of EQX Biome, a financial marketplace for nature-based investments. EQX Biome is based in New York and founded on the mission of making biodiversity conservation investable in order to protect the world's remaining biodiversity. He's a licensed investment banker, an accomplished author, and a regular speaker on sustainable capital markets and biodiversity finance. He holds a Master of Law from our law school a doctorate from the un in corporate law from the University of Vienna, and a JD degree from the University of v Vienna. So I'm going to turn this over to Wendy. It's going to be an excellent and interesting panel, and we're, we can't wait to hear from you folks. Take it away, Wendy. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for the amazing um, introduction. <laughs> and, our, um, and I'm really excited to see a full house here at Pulitzer Hall for our first uh, biodiversity-focused um, panel discussion here at the School of Professional Studies. Um, so it is inspiring and, and um, in, itso in and of itself that there's so much interest in solving the biodiversity crisis. And I'm excited to embark on that conversation tonight with my esteemed colleagues and fellow pan panelists um, here on stage. Um, I'm going to start, though, um, by framing the biodiversity crisis with maybe a lot of people's favorite animal, which is the African elephant. It's a story of one species, but it's really a reflection of what's happening um, to our natural world. Um, when my grandmother was born, uh, there were 10 million African elephants roaming the continent. By the time I was born, which was the 70s, there were only a million left, and today, that number for African elephants has dropped to just over 400,000. And just in 2021, their conservation status was updated, but it's really a downgrade. Um, African savanna elephants are no, now endangered, and the forest elephant, the smaller one, is critically endangered. The forest elephant's population dropped by, I think it was 86% in the last 31 years alone. Um, you know, they truly are one step behind extinction and what a deep loss that would be to humanity. And I say it because elephants are one of our most loved species. You know, it's one that humans uh, gravitate to. They're on the pages of our children's storybooks and yet we can't seem to sort of save them. So we are facing, and, and they represent the plight of so many other species on our planet. As Steve said, one million species today face extinction out of about 8 million on our planet. So biodiversity really is in crisis, um, and it's an urgent issue um, in need of more attention. So tonight, it's wonderful to have a panel of experts here talking and focusing on how to solve uh, or solutions that could help us solve the biodiversity crisis. And it's going to involve all of us, governments, businesses, indigenous communities, bankers, poets, policy makers. So I'm really excited um, for us to, to get started and um, have the conversation because biodiversity really doesn't have uh, any time to lose. 
So with that, um, I'd love to start with kind of the, the basics. What, I'll ask the panel, what is it really that is driving this mass extinction of biodiversity and wildlife on our planet? I could start with Amy, ecologist on the sure. <laughs> team here. Yeah, and thank you all so much for being here. It really is so encouraging to see so much interest in this. Um, so when we talk about biodiversity loss and the causes for biodiversity decline, we can identify the main drivers, the direct drivers behind biodiversity loss. Um, the first one is land use or sea use change. So that's essentially habitat loss through land conversion from natural areas to human use landscapes, be it urban, um, agricultural, industrial, etc. Um, the second major cause is over-exploitation, so overuse, um, which is actually the number one cause of biodiversity decline in marine environments. Um, third is climate change, but that is anticipated to take the number one spot in coming decades as the main driver of biodiversity loss. Um, the fourth one is pollution, and the fifth one is invasive species. Um, but I think something that's important to note is that even though we have these direct drivers of biodiversity loss and we do need to address each of those directly, there are indirect drivers that lay beneath the surface of those direct drivers. And those are the really tricky things to get at, the social, political, cultural, behavioral drivers, um, our economic systems, our system of production and consumption, um, our worldview of how we see our place in nature and our relationship to it. Mm -hmm. So in our class, we refer to that as the paradigm shift, <laughs> the transformative change that needs to occur. Um, but all of those drivers do need to be addressed at all different sectors. Yeah. And I think um, it's important to think of those indirect drivers. I know we were talking about it earlier, that it's not just about like if you if you saving an elephant per se, but the whole ecosystem is very complicated and interconnected. And if you pull one thread of life out, that kind of web can start to fall apart. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would just add to that, that one of the problems is addressing everything in isolation yes. is what we like to do, whereas all of those are very interrelated. So yes, habitat loss number one, you know, recent study came out, it was over 60% yes. of, of endangerment of vertebrates, things with backbones on land is because of, of forest, just forest loss, trop, just tropical forest loss. But there is a lot of those bad synergies with the, as forest is lost, it's easier to go and hunt the animals and it's easier for invasive species to get there as well. So there's every, that's my big take home message is everything is interconnected. And climate change is kind of the great exacerbator of all of it mm -hmm. as well. But I'd still say habitat loss is going to stay number one for a while. <laughs> and I think maybe just, I'm not sure if this works. Uh, first of all, hi everyone, thanks for making it. Um, I think maybe one thing to add to um, what was just said about sort of the different observations we have around la land conversion, I think the big question is also what is causing that? And so there's this layer of corporations in between. I think we don't really want to pinpoint um, or badmouth corporations because they are obviously solution providers for modern society. But uh, we really have to actually pinpoint that and say <laughs> big corporations have their supply chains in places where today they really shouldn't be. And they are also the intermediary to the demand side, which is all of us, planet Earth, has a lot of people now, we have been offered products that simply cause biodiversity loss. Mm -hmm. So if you buy, you know, uh, this consumer products, if you buy an iPhone, there will be minerals that are now coming out of very complicated places, including deep sea, rainforests, and biodiversity hotspots. So it's, I think, important we look at demand for meat. There are a billion people in Asia coming online. That is driving a lot of land conversion. It's minerals as we transition from you know, traditional energy sources to climate change uh, friendly renewable energy. All that is driving yet another thing that um, uh, has a supply chain sitting in a complicated place. So we really have to start thinking, to your point, more cyclically and, and, and think things through a little bit better. Yeah, and I think tying all of that together, and I think, Amy, you really said everything we need to know in terms of the drivers. Um, but what is critically lacking, and we heard that in the very beginning today, here tonight, um, is really to have a comprehensive international policy framework 
to galvanize global action to prevent biodiversity loss and to fight biodiversity loss um, and to reverse what's already happened. Um, again, in the climate space, again, it was mentioned in the very uh, beginning remarks here, hit it right on the nail. In the climate space, we've come so much further because that conversation has been around for that much longer. Um, the joke was, right, that we're only at Biodiversity COP, well, 16 is coming up uh, in October, um, and we just concluded Climate COP 28. So quite frankly, we can look at that as an illustration of how much further and how much more mature those international policy negotiations and discussions and implementation stages are for climate. We are direly far behind when we're discussing biodiversity policy. And in order to address all of those critical drivers that you mentioned, mm -hmm. we need the incentivizing policy to encourage that action. That is what's really going to get the global community and all actors of civil society, inclusive of corporations, private sector at large, um, to really move in the right direction. Um, everything starts with having that enabling policy environment. So that's a great um, point to make if you, where the, sort of the science is clear that the number one driver of extinction is land use change, habitat loss, um, and that uh, it, what, what it will take in terms of saving and protecting habitat is getting towards fifth, half Earth, which is protecting and putting aside, not putting aside, but having on Earth and on, in the sea 50% available for biodiversity for wild species. Um, and so the world is kind of convalescing around those goals. You may have heard of it 30 by 30. So that's sort of the halfway step to get to 30% protected by 2030, kind of on the road to hopefully 50% protected by 2050. Um, and that's sort of kind of made its way into the global policy framework. Maybe you can explain where you're seeing that, Agnes. Oh, absolutely. So again, I did say, yes, we are far behind, but also referenced um, COP15. So that is the latest biodiversity COP, biodiversity COP15, um, that took place in December 2022. And that is really what has now been described as the Paris Agreement mo moment for nature, for biodiversity. Uh, because that is the first time we truly have such a comprehensive framework to address biodiversity loss. It is an international policy framework that outlines 23 targets and four very ambitious goals. Those 23 targets are on a 2030 timeline. The four overarching goals are on a 2050 timeline. Uh, and again, as um, Amy mentioned, one of those goals is indeed um, Target 13 deals with the um, 30 by 30, uh, and that is a conservation target to, to really, for the global community to align and commit to conserving and protecting 30% of land and ocean um, by 2030. And that target has already resulted in very broad galvanizing policy action on a national level, uh, including here in the US. Mm -hmm. And I do want to make this point, it's always uh, quite surprising to people, um, that what we are in the US, it's we are in a bit of a challenging position when you're looking at the US government in negotiating international uh, biodiversity policy because we're actually not a party to the CBD. There are only two countries in the world that are not a party to the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD. It is the US and it is the Vatican. Um, and the US is such a diplomatic superpower that that voice is really missing in that space. Um, and it is quite a challenging position for, for US national biodiversity action. Um, so that is a point I always like to bring up. But as discussed before, uh, when we were preparing for this panel, what is interesting to see is, again, I represent the United States Council for International Business. We have 300 companies in our membership they operate tran transnationally, transjurisdictionally. So they are already getting ahead of that issue. They are already understanding that we actually do have to act on biodiversity. We do have to report on our impacts and dependencies on biodiversity, the same way that we have been doing on climate for quite a few years by now. Meanwhile, the US government internationally is lagging behind because they're not necessarily at the table in the same way as they would if the CBD was ratified by the US. 
So that is a complex um, diplomatic consideration um, to, to consider when you're looking at the speed of implementation of, for example, the GBF targets nationally in the US. Um, but it's encouraging to see that willingness and that speed in the private sector is already picking up. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we heard from Matthias in terms of corporates being implementation partners and implementation leaders in our modern economy and in the biodiversity space. We can already see that. Certainly more is needed to be done, but it's at least an encouraging trend to see from, from where I'm sitting. Yeah, I think I'll just add to that that we're in this 2030 is very soon. I'm like looking at my watch thinking, yeah. uh, we, yeah, we don't have a lot of time to get there. Um, and the world currently on average is only 17% protected. So there's a long way to go to get to 30% by 2030. So it really needs to accelerate urgently. And um, it's going to take all of us and all types of organizations. And uh, the world you know, also has lots of other challenges that need to be addressed and funded from climate adaptation, mitigation, loss and damage, electrification, you know, tra transforming agriculture. So there's a lot that needs to be done and it's all going to cost money. And I think if we're going to get to protect biodiversity, it's going to be expensive. And I'm wondering, Matthias, maybe you can uh, explain where we're at in terms of the biodiversity funding gap and how much more do we need to to kind of raise for nature mm -hmm. yeah no um if you'll allow me a small detour because sure. i think <laughs> given everyone in the room came here because of the biodiversity topic and i think we all have different access points to it so i kind of wanted to say one thing that i think helped me kind of take it full circle i've always been kind of wired to be very like nature loving and friendly whatever that that means but the really interesting thing is when we talk about nature and biodiversity, the discussion on the one hand often becomes about tigers, lions, and those sort of banner species. But the thing that humanity really needs to recognize, and this has already happened now at the political level, is that those insects and different animals and microorganisms together form really complex things that are the reason we have an atmosphere and are the reason we have a climate and are the reason we are here, are allowed to live or are able to live. And over the last 30 years, um, really the lifetime of the average person in this room, I would suspect, we have destroyed almost everything there was ever, you know, there, that, that there ever was. We have managed to get to a point where we sort of push off the disk about 40,000 species per year. I mean, it's really, really staggering. And that's, I think, the point is not the doomsday, it is um, the magnitude of the problem is becoming rampantly clear. As we look to climate change, we're realizing, oh wow, actually the climate is directly tied to nature and the amount of nature we have, because if we have a lot of nature, nature starts you know, sequestering carbon. As we pollute more, nature could actually balance it out. But we're cutting nature back. We're uh, accelerating the extinction, extinction crisis, so it's becoming more difficult. And so these things all blend together to put into context the power of kind of what's happening globally. It took 50 years to get from climate science to a Paris Agreement and that uh, has goals that are out in 2050. It took only uh, a fraction of that for the polit politicians involved around the world to say, wow, we have a much bigger, more urgent problem on biodiversity loss, this esoteric thing that's going to actually you know, cause problems with our own lifeline. So let's set a target of 2030. And the overlooked goal in that treaty is actually not the 30 by 30. It's to instantly, if possible, dead stop biodiversity loss. It says that very clearly. We need to stop extinctions. and so long-winded way to getting to the question of, you know, of biodiversity finance. To be able to stop biodiversity loss and have a, sh a meaningful shot at protecting what's left and also at, at some event of restoration, we need about seven to nine hundred billion dollars a year. That's an enormous sum of money that governments, who are currently the prime sponsor of biodiversity protection, do not have. This money does not exist in public funding or in donation. 
So the only shot we have at getting this stopped is actually by mobilizing private capital markets. Now the great thing, and a lot of you know, just you know, banks and institutional investors often are known to cause the very issue. They fund drilling, they fund forest clearing, and so on and so forth. But in the end, that money just wants to make a bit more money. And this is really the really powerful thing about finance is there are about $100 trillion in the US capital markets alone, equity debt markets. All they want is somewhere between 4 to 15% returns depending on risk profile. If you offer something that generates the ability for an investor to deploy capital and get a little bit more back on top of their money they put in, then this funding gap is solved. And so my company was formed on the basis of how do we actually set those financial incentives that if somebody puts money in, they get a bit more back. Um, and then it's theoretically solvable. So I kind of like park it here now, but I'm happy to go into more details on it. But it's entirely solvable. We just need to be able to kind of connect and, and structure these investment opportunities. I'll just add to that because I work in the non-profit philanthropic world. I do want to see philanthropic investment stepping up. And we're seeing huge announcements, um, historical announcements about funding for biodiversity. So I think there's hope there. I do see, though, that the corporate world needs to step up, um, at least in terms of philanthropic funding. If, here in the US alone, which is a very generous um, nation, thank you to all that donate to amazing causes. Um, the, the piece of that giving pie that goes to the environment, which covers climate change, conservation, um, is only 3% of giving. So, and then within that giving pie, corporates only give 7%. It's mostly individuals who are giving and foundations. So I think there's a big, um, big amount of financing that can come from, firstly, us all changing our priorities. I think about all the, um, challenges we have that we need to fund that are being funded through charities and all of them would cease to exist if we didn't have nature so three percent of the pie is not enough but also corporates are not really giving either so maybe that's a good segue into asking what is the role of business and corporates in helping to fill this gap we've got invest investors and finance and banks but what about the business world how are they responding to the biodiversity crisis and that's, they don't have to do it out of the goodness of their heart, right? That's what this whole master's program is about. It's a win-win for corporations and financial institutions. If you reduce your inputs from the natural world and you reduce the waste you produce that has to be then somehow dealt with by the natural world, you're gonna make a bit more money, right? It, and so that's where things like these disclosure recommendations for ways for businesses to recognize how they are dependent on nature. And I just want to take a, a, a slight detour <laughs> to say, <laughs> since we're using one of my favorite words. So nature seems to be defined as anything that isn't humans or human-made things or human culture. So there is the non-living part, the minerals, the lithium, the, all, all the stuff that doesn't have microbes involved, which really, what, you know, <laughs> is there anything that our true overlords the microbes aren't in charge of? But then there's the living part of the natural world or natural assets or you know, natural resources, natural capital, however you want to look at it. And so the living part of nature, of these natural assets, if you want to commodify it completely, but we won't go there. <laughs> so the living part, that is biodiversity. So I, I also, one of my take home messages, other than everything is interconnected, is, is there a living component? Then that is biodiversity. So it's not just the species, charismatic, microscopic, which is very important, and there's a lot we don't know about them. Fungi, there are true overlords. <laughs> but also, are you, is there, are you in a living thing, right? Are you the genetic diversity? That's the fundamental currency of all variation we see uh, of life on this planet. That is the evolutionary potential <laughs> for all living things. Then genetic diversity is also biodiversity. 
And then are, are you, do you have living things in you like this room? This room is an ecosystem, a forest, the campus, a, a drop of water on a leaf, my, my left molar. Those are all ecosystems. And at, at the above species level, that is also biodiversity. So it's the forest and the classroom and the agricultural field. But also, do you have interactions with living things? Is there an, any living thing involved interacting with either another living thing or with a non-living part of the world? Those interactions, whether it's eating or competing with or being a host to pathogens, those interactions are also biodiversity. And so you can look at the e ecological functions that the living things have and how they interact with other living things in the non-living world. And if those functions somehow help human well-being uh, and or economies, now that ecosystem function has turned into an ecosystem service. And that was paradigm shifting when it came to trying to convince people who didn't care about a particular type of fungus, or even elephants. There are people who would not care if all the, the African elephants went extinct. So how are you going to convince them? You can't convince someone who doesn't believe that because a living thing exists, it has the right to continue existing. That's called intrinsic value. Now, I mean, I'm sure the people on the stage, and hopefully most of the people in the room, would think, would, would believe that. But if you don't believe it, you're not going to be convinced. So you can say, ah, what about all the services they do for you for free? And they do a lot of things for free, right? We've already talked about it. Do you want an atmosphere? Do you want the water cycle to keep going, right? Cement, cement is a very water intensive industry. It needs biodiversity to keep that water cycle going. So that's all to say. So these are uh, things like the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures, the TNFD, where the final version came out in September, based on the TCFD for carbon. And it has tried to align with all the other different kinds of reporting standards. It's a, it, it's a set of recommendations for businesses to be able to figure out what ecosystem services they're dependent on, what ecosystem services they're impacting, and how does that translate into physical risks? Do they need paper for their, their pulp? Or do they need the water cycle to continue their cement industry? How that translates into transition risks as well. Things like, are there going to be regulations that are coming that you are going to have to pay attention to, like in the EU and, and other places? And also reputational risks, uh, changing consumer behavior, changing investor priorities, which hopefully you all heard the SEC panel that was here. Because really, you could take that whole SEC panel and just swap out carbon for biodiversity. And, and pretty much all the points people made are going to hold true for that as well. So it is in companies' best interest to recognize their dependencies and their impacts. Because it also leads to opportunities, right? You can also reduce, like I said, you can reduce your costs. There can be cost savings. There can be new technologies. There also, the opposite of greenwashing can happen. Mm. So I, th I think I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> and I can add to that a bit sure. too. So um, right, it is, it is biodiversity that is doing <laughs> the ecosystem functioning that we all rely on. It is just, it is inescapable. We are biophysical entities. We rely on functioning ecosystems. Biodiversity are the living things carrying out these functions we depend on, right? Um, I think it's also important to bring up that biodiversity is um, a form of natural insurance under changing conditions. So under climate change scenarios, under any kind of environmental change, um, the more species diversity you have, the more genetic diversity you have, the more buffer you have, that even if some changes occur and some species are lost, some genes are lost, you're still going to have enough diversity that something will be able to continue that ecosystem function. You'll still have species representative of different functional groups so that can still perform carbon sequestration and water filtration and pollination services, right? Um, and as businesses whose supply chains and materials and inputs are made by functioning ecosystems, made by biodiversity, yes, they are 
absolutely dependent upon biodiversity. And now we are we are starting to see them, um, stakeholders, um, C-suite folks, realizing that they are also at risk from biodiversity loss, just like we see companies and businesses being at risk from climate change, right? Um, so it is important to identify the uh, dependencies on nature, the impacts to nature, but I think it's also important with, with things like the, the task force, the TNFD, and these other frameworks, um, we don't want them to become simple uh, check off the box, we fulfilled our regulatory requirements if it does become a requirement. Biodiversity doesn't care about our frameworks. <laughs> it doesn't care about our, where we're funneling our, our finances. It doesn't care about these policies unless they result in on the ground change, right? It is the physical environment that biodiversity sees. That is the scale at which biodiversity operates. So if we're going to be measuring these things and you know finding the appropriate metrics to use, it has to result in some kind of on the ground conservation, restoration, connectivity in order for species to feel the impact of that. And that's a really great point. And I think as a conservationist who works on the ground and seeing the massive need, I mean, we do at Wild Tomorrow World Ranger Day every day, every year. And you can imagine these rangers, these protected areas that don't even have enough funding to buy uniforms for them. The reserve manager at a UNESCO World Heritage Site, by the way, in a global biodiversity hotspot said to us a year ago, you know, I don't have even budget to buy uniforms for my team. I have to choose this year if I buy them each one shirt or one pair of pants. So you know, this is the kind of bottom line that you see on the ground, this absolute like lack of funding and support. So I guess my concern is, or I hear and I'm excited about all the yeah global initiatives and the frameworks and the, the suits and the business world talking about biodiversity, but my hope is that it really does make its way to the ground. So how do we prioritize or help businesses and, and investors make sure that that investment, we don't have money to waste and we don't have time to lose, so how do we make sure that this, these new funding and frameworks actually create impact on the ground and how do we prioritize where that should be? Maybe Matthias can talk to that. Yep. No, prioritization is I think one of the, the really big challenges in this space. This started with climate change is now trickling over into biodiversity loss. I think part of the reason to shift the blame in, in, in somewhere or trying to find why isn't this happening in a more focused way is actually I think the way the political process around you know all countries sending representatives to negotiate a global treaty, every country wants to do well, every negotiator shows up with their piece, you know, my country is gonna do this. The problem is we're, we now have these global agreements, but we're really not very good at prioritizing yet. And so um, my company ultimately, you know, we took a map of what's worth saving if we really didn't have much time left, we needed to act very quickly and we have to be efficient about it. And it's actually pretty straightforward to uh, then focus in on, I would call it three places, and I'm sure everyone has a different view on this, but um, when we look at biodiversity maps, it's rainforests, the deep sea, and so-called biodiversity hotspots. These are areas that are really responsible as the last places where uh, biodiversity or nature can still be left alone and is thriving, but they are all under attack meaning we're you know, digging our supply chains deeper into rainforests, deeper into the deep sea for minerals and hotspots uh, by definition are, have a strong species variety but then are under threat. So we must prioritize those places. I would argue that uh, rainforests need massively more prioritization and I wanna spend just one minute on this. I would fire myself if I, if I didn't <laughs> leave you with this, with this note. Um, rainforests are home to more than 50% of terrestrial biodiversity. The Amazon alone, which is the largest uh, rainforest, is the size of the United States, and it is responsible for, together with the Congo Basin and some parts in Indonesia, rainforests collectively sequester about a third of global emissions. They're responsible for, this is just the Amazon, cleaning a quarter of the world's fresh water and then distributing it across Europe, the US, Africa. They are the water supply chain. Um, they produce an enormous amount of oxygen, 
All these are amazing, important things. But the Amazon is about to reach a tipping point where the whole thing is set to die back. I want to let that sink in. Science says we have cut so much of this rainforest that it is about to not, be, uh, not produce enough rain anymore. So the whole thing could die back. And it turns from being a massive solution and home for biodiversity to the biggest single problem humanity has ever faced. And still, we have supply chains digging in. So how do we solve it? I think every company in the world should, step one, look whether their supply chain is in rainforests and stop immediately. Uh, same for deep sea, same for hotspots. And then, step two, let's contribute to the funding of protected areas, spaces where we actually put a protective shield around uh, spaces. So enough talking time, but rainforests are really important. <laughs> <laughs> and the Brazilian part of the Amazon is already emitting more carbon than it is taking out of the atmosphere here through photosynthesis. It is a carbon source instead of a sink. Fortunately, in all nine countries, thanks to protected areas and especially indigenous lands, the Amazon in total is still barely a sink, taking more carbon out than it's emitting. But it is going the wrong way. And if we lose just a few more percentages, it could be the tipping point of, of trees. Yeah. Um, I would just like to bring us back a little bit to, to the TNFD reference. Um, because again, that is such an excellent example, quite frankly, of the extreme impact that these global negotiations and global treaties actually have. Because the TNFD has very quickly um, garnered a lot of attention and also already is pretty set for broad adoption, uh, well, adoption among corporations globally. And the reason for that is Target 15 of the Global Biodiversity Framework. Target 15 is the very first time that there is a designated target specifically dealing with business and biodiversity, and especially in the context of businesses being called, to, uh, called on to evaluate their dependencies, impacts, and risks associated with biodiversity, and a call on reporting on those. And again, the TNFD um, has been broadly recognized as the tool to do so. And there's so much exciting work happening in that particular space in terms of really equipping the private sector to properly evaluate, assess, and really report and acknowledge their dependencies um, on biodiversity and the impacts they're having on biodiversity. So yes, the TNFD, but also what's underway right now is an IPBS assessment. So IPBES, IPES, mm -hmm. is the IPCC of the CBD, if that makes sense. <laughs> <a lot of laughs> <acronyms. laughs> Does that make sense? I, I think it makes sense, right? Uh, <laughs> so it's basically the, the scientific, the research arm, right, um, informing the CBD. Um, and that is the first time ever that IPES is doing a business and biodiversity assessment. Um, and that assessment alone, I heard this directly from the IPES secretariat, has garnered the most attention, the most inquiries, just the most attention at large than any assessment they've ever done. Mm -hmm. The interest is massive, not only from private sector, but from everyone. Um, and that assessment has already been stated that the outcome of that assessment will directly further inform the full implementation of Target 15. Because in terms of where we're standing in the negotiations right now, yes, the GBF was agreed December 2022. Now we're in the implementation phase. And the way the CBD is structured as a convention is that now this GBF needs to have a, an accompanying monitoring framework. So what is being negotiated is all of these detailed indicators for each target of the framework so that there can be proper measurements on progress made towards all of these 23 targets and the four goals. Um, but yeah, I can just say on the TNFD piece, it really is quite exciting to see um, that outcome from target 15. But there's also challenges related to that. I think we heard uh, before that, yes, the TNFD is coming, but we're seeing now an onslaught of various uh, biodiversity reporting standards coming out. And that actually creates challenges in terms of, um, again, adding perhaps too much of an admin burden versus actually being able to focus on the implementation and ensuring that um, implementation efforts are taking place on the ground. That's something I've already, concerningly enough, heard from some of our member companies that 
at this point, across all of the environmental requirements that we're seeing, environmental reporting requirements, across climate, across, it's going to come soon, plastic pollution, um, across biodiversity reporting requirements, it's becoming um, such a financial burden, especially mm -hmm. to large corporates, to where it's actually costing them more money to fulfill all these reporting requirements versus what they are able to put on real implementation efforts. And that is something to be mindful of. Um, so I think there's opportunity there for streamlining and harmonization and making sure that there is global agreement on that, especially because we're seeing, again, a special challenges for MNCs that do operate transnationally, transjurisdictionally. Um, so that's also just something to, to be aware of because we don't want to slow down implementation. Mm -hmm. We want to ensure that we're incentivizing and it. I was going to say, I think as a conservationist, always looking for money yeah. <laughs> and knowing how far it goes on the ground. If you're, you know, thinking about a rhino to, to, to for an intervention for rhino to help save them from poachers is about $1,500 per rhino. And that's actually a lot in a, in a developing economy. So it would be really upsetting if all that funding that could help wildlife on the ground where even rangers don't have uniforms that is being spent um, on kind of the business of reporting. So um, yeah, but because Matthias got to say that, you know, we've got to prioritize rainforest. I'm just going to put a pitch out there for wildlife corridors as well. <laughs> because um, habitat loss, yes. uh, yeah. If you, you know, we can't save everything. So a corridor will help by connecting to existing protected areas together. And if you can do that, you raise the carrying capacity, the ability of both those parks or wildlife reserves to have more wildlife. So it's kind of a good strat strategic plan if you don't have unlimited finances to protect that piece of land in the middle that would connect the two together. And I'm not sure if we have other debate on where to protect next or how to prioritize, but I think it's important. <laughs> yeah. Um Currently ecologically intact large areas that are connected would probably be top priority in biodiversity hotspots in particular. Um, you know, I think it's also important to note that, and this has come up a few times without actually identifying it, I guess, but the connection between the lands that are required for biodiversity conservation and those that are required for climate stabilization overlap a lot. So by combining those two, I think there's like 92% overlap mm -hmm. between the lands that have been identified as necessary for protection for climate stabilization or also biodiversity protection areas that are very critical. Um, so I think looking at those kind of multifunctional landscapes as candidates for, for conservation, as well as the large, ecologically intact, well-connected corridors in between. Um, but I also don't want to ignore things like the urban environment and urban mm -hmm. landscapes. You know, we often write off urban centers for biodiversity conservation, but nature exists in cities. Um, in some cities, there are even species that have become adapted to prefer landscapes where people are there, right? Um, they can become refuges for even threatened or endangered species if they're managed appropriately. Um, and so, you know, we often think of nature as something that exists out there, away from us. We don't see nature, supposedly, when we look out the window here, because it's no longer a northeastern deciduous forest, right? Um, but if we think about nature as only existing in the national parks and in the Amazon, we feel very disconnected from it and from our relationship to it. And if we can bring nature more into cities, and make that inextricable relationship between humans and the natural world clearer, I really think it would go a long way in, you know, I keep coming back to the paradigm shift and the transformative change of how we view ourselves as connected to nature, um, which would help conservation efforts not only here, but in places all around the world. Yeah, and I think um, it was mentioned that indigenous peoples are yes. Protectors of the world, 80% of the world's biodiversity, and always strikes me that they have so much more wisdom in terms of how they see themselves as part of nature, not um, there's separate no dichotomy. or dominant in, in some, nature. In some cultures, the yes. word nature is actually relatively new yes. if you trace back the linguistic history of it, because why would you ever need to have this separate concept of something that is mm. us as well? Um, so, yeah, it's a relatively new term. And I think we can all find awe in nature. I get very excited if a woodpecker or a cardinal comes to my window and it's a reminder. And, and I think E.O. Wilson, famous biologist said, 
every wildflower in that crack of the wall is a miracle. It took millions of years of evolution for that flower to be able to live in the crack of your wall. So it's, um, I think it's really important for people to connect to nature here because that's where we are. Yeah. Um, and I think um, as well, it's sort of sh shown itself in the climate um, communication that lots of doom and gloom doesn't really um, help us. And, and by being more connected to nature, I think we can find um, reasons to want to care and protect the natural world. Yeah, because ultimately, if we value nature, these nature positive actions will naturally flow from that value system. Maybe, yep, if I can just like, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> since we're now on the positive side of all of this, yeah. I think one thing that's also quite cool about the topic of biodiversity, so, you know, uh, in a place like Colombia, um, uh, where, where stuff like this can still be taught from the source. What, what, what I find interesting is like there is you know, no shortage, it doesn't really matter what you care about, uh, whether it can be your, your hook is climate change, finance, social issues, nature just intrinsically, everything leads to biodiversity. And the one I want to pick out, because I've, you know, I'll admit, uh, maybe ought to admit on a stage like this, but I, uh, I've always just cared more about uh, animals and, and, and nature, uh, species. I've always felt like there were so many people going after social causes and I felt like I wanted to get engaged on, on the nature side and fight for nature and rainforests. But if you look at the solutions, they all, especially in rainforest, tie to social problems. Mm -hmm. You have in rainforests some of the least privileged, most impoverished populations on earth. And solving rainforest loss is often all about solving poverty in these areas. And so again, it doesn't really matter what your hook is into the topic, they all lead into this space. And it might sound at first, look, oh, this is a biology topic. <laughs> it really isn't, and we ought to recognize that relatively quickly because the solutions require everyone to come together and again, stop corporations from digging it up, finance, start getting finance for you know, the protective actions and then making sure that supply chains really don't touch those key places. Yeah, I could just add saying again, as um, I think it was Amy who said it, in terms of valuing biodiversity, mm -hmm. um, and once you start valuing biodiversity, the action will follow. Um, so and now I'll actually have to look at my notes because I'm going to say some very specific numbers. Um, so the annual economic value produced by biodiversity yeah. is more than $150 trillion. That amounts to nearly twice the world's GDP. Uh, and industries highly dependent on nature generate 15% of a global GDP. So that is $13 trillion. Moderately nature dependent industries generate 37% of global GDP. That amounts to $31 trillion. And these sectors include uh, construction, agriculture, food and beverage. And then of course there's plenty of additional industries and sectors that dependent to a less degree, but still is a critical portion of their operations. They are dependent on biodiversity. They are dependent on nature. And we mentioned this a bit earlier in the conversation that if, um, if biodiversity completely, if nature completely collapses, that is not certainly in the interest of business <laughs> either <laughs> because nothing will function. Mm -hmm. um, it is business critical um, to, to care and to, to understand that relationship. Um, so I could say that there's certainly, quite frankly, a vested interest to get it right. Uh, there's a vested interest to, uh, to be present in these policy negotiations and ensure that the outcomes are constructive. Um, and sometimes perhaps that looks like less prescriptive actions in order for it to actually be implementable. But there is, quite literally, no pun intended, a vested interest to get it right. And I would, I would just add, because I had those same numbers, right? Yeah. I mean, so that, that works out to something like 55% of global GDP is at least moderately dependent yes. on these ecosystem services. But so is the rest. So these numbers are just coming from the most direct and maybe a few indirect uh, uh, consequences of or, or re reliance on, on ecosystem services. But if you go even just another couple of degrees out. We are all dependent. Every business is going to be dependent 
on biodiversity. And I think you mentioned it before, but I'm going to say it again. I think we also we can value nature for business reasons, but there's, and I think all the nature lovers here agree, there is like this moral, ethical drive to protect nature. I think how could we explain to the future generations that elephants no longer exist or the amazing dung beetle that navigates by the celestial stars, you know, like there is, I think for anyone who works in conservation, that drive is there kind of to value nature kind of for its in and of itself. Um, but yes, if we need an excuse for business to care, um, you know, it does there the world kind of depends on it. Right, so. yeah, if you want an excuse for business to care about dung beetles, which again, they should not <laughs> need, it's, it, it, they, it's about $400 million of ecosystem service that it gives to the U.S. cattle industry by taking care of the cattle poop. <laughs> not to mention all the seeds that were in the poop mm -hmm. of all the plants that need the dung beetles to bury it in a little bit of fertilizing poop for those species to regenerate. You know, my, my beloved, I'm a monkey person, beloved <laughs> spider monkeys in Ecuador, in just one year, a spider monkey pooped out 200,000 seeds of something like a, you know, so that what some of those trees are going to be important to lots of other biodiversity and perhaps an ecosystem service then, maybe it is trees that humans directly harvested or sold products to, or the humans depended on other species that needed those trees, or depended on other species that depended on other species that depended on other species that needed those trees. Can I ask a question to sure. some of our panels? <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, in your work with, with corporates and with business leaders, how easy or difficult has it been to convince them to pay attention to impacts on nature or just even just having them see their dependencies on nature? Like, has this been an uphill battle or are they relatively eager um, to take part? I love that question <laughs> <laughs> because, um, so again, the way we operate at USCIB, we don't necessarily, you know, we don't, how do I say this? We, we monitor and we engage in what business asks us to engage in, right? Um, and what was really interesting, because I led all of our biodiversity work, um, attended all of the negotiations, participated in all of the negotiations leading up to COP15, and truly, we were kind of thinking, you know, again, the U.S. is not a party to the CBD, so we were thinking how much attention will actually U.S. business, because again, we represent U.S. business specifically, right? So how much attention will actually U.S. business pay to these negotiations? What will the interest look like? Because I, I have to bring this context in, we've been extremely active as an organization in the climate cops um, ever since its very inception. We've been present at every single climate cop in history. Um, so again, we were not really certain what would interest be. Now, here is the very interesting part. Um, I had a delegation of over 20 companies mm -hmm. um, come to Montreal with me for Biodiversity COP15. Uh, and this year, and we're still, we are still in January, <laughs> uh, just um, this year already received multiple requests. So I came back from, uh, from my holiday break and I had multiple requests in my inbox. Hey, we're looking towards Biodiversity COP16. What's going on there? Are you following it? Are you engaged? Is there a way for us to uh, join your delegation in Colombia? So they are already interested in COP16. That's in October this year in Colombia. So, and that also speaks to where they're willing to allocate their corporate budgets in terms of travel budgets and attention and efforts. So, interestingly enough, and I do say this from a point of view of actually hearing and seeing what these leading U.S. Um, corporations are prioritizing, um, there is a huge interest in biodiversity. It's a huge interest. And it is especially interesting because in the U.S. specifically, that means that the U.S. business community is kind of leading that because the government leadership is not there because the U.S. is not a party to the CBD. So that's a pretty interesting, yeah. you know, it's, a, it's an interesting dichotomy to see a little bit. Um, and also I want to add another reason to why biodiversity is, shall we say, trending a little bit. This is the <laughs> first ever biodiversity panel organized here as well. So I think it's as a topic, it's really be becoming well known that it's so important is the climate change and biodiversity nexus. Right. We saw that play out at Climate COP28 last year, where for the first time ever, the climate champion that was uh, appointed for COP28 is actually also the president of the IUCN. Hmm. So she really put 
the biodiversity and climate change nexus on the agenda. And for the first time ever, there was even a declaration coming out of a climate cop on the importance of biodiversity. Right. And in the outcome document from COP28, there is a reference, direct reference to the GBF. Mm -hmm. So it's really coming everywhere. And our members are certainly seeing that and realizing that, oh, we actually have to really pay attention and act on it. Mm -hmm. So I see a very strong interest. And Matthias, how is it going on your side, getting investors to, to invest in your solutions for protecting biodiversity? Is it a easy, easier conversation than it used to be, or how, how do you see it? Yeah, so I'm going to just quickly add a little bit more uh, cynical observations on top of what you just said. <laughs> so I, I agree, you know, biodiversity is now all over the place. Part of the reason why you're in this room probably is you've heard somewhere about biodiversity. We've got these agreements, but I still find that, you know, corporations and, and I find this true for climate change as well as biodiversity loss. Corporations tend to love to build capacity around checklist building processes. And like, I think there's a recognition now that, okay, this is, a, we already have a global agreement. We're supposed to stop biodiversity loss and, and corporations know intrinsically, just like with carbon, that they're sort of responsible for what's happening. And so I think there's a sense, let's check, let's make sure that we're on top of this. And there's for sure a positive sense of excitement, which is badly needed, right? We cannot always have topics have these like negative connotations. So I think people, uh, you know, uh, focus on that. I do think we're still lacking massively forward uh, action, mm -hmm. right? Like I think on carbon, we're addressing a minor aspect through corporate action of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. We are you know, not yet seeing uh, either massive scale, on a corporate by corporate basis, massive scale decarbonization, either through adjusting your supply chain, nor are we seeing it through the carbon markets. Both are badly needed, we cannot do just one. And the same is true for biodiversity loss. I think we need to really make sure that companies understand this is on them. They need to go look, they need to go come up with solutions of how to you know, address this problem. So what we're hoping for, um, and I will now answer this question, <laughs> is my company is focused on creating really large scale rainforest reserves which are operated for profit. And the way we operate them as for profit is we basically mobilize uh, carbon markets. Uh, so on the one hand, our balance sheet says, here's a, for this area, there's a cost of conservation. We spend money in this area to reduce deforestation. That's the cost. And we generate revenue to the extent we're successful at doing that. And you can see deforestation rate go from 1.5% to 0.5%. You earn carbon credits for that. There's a specific type called red plus or avoidance carbon that has gotten uh, a lot of bad press, mm -hmm. rightly so, but really important to still stick to the space because it, is, uh, it enables uh, players like us to monetize conservation work. But so for us, we're starting to see kind of like both the carbon market becoming healthier, more robust. There's been a lot of movement around what does a quality, high integrity carbon market look like? And so, you know, the ability to sell carbon credits, the ability to raise financing for it are all going in the right direction. But it all rests on companies becoming much more serious about we need to decarbonize, we need to stop biodiversity loss. So I'm hoping for a lot more pressure on them. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to say it, is it the elephant in the room? Um, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's probably heard about biodiversity credits. I want to know more, but I, I feel like it's sort of in flux and in the middle of being created and different frameworks coming out. And there's a lot of criticism of the carbon markets right now. Like, what is a biodiversity credit? Does it exist yet? And is it going to help? Who wants to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> Not it. I, we only have a few minutes. <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. So the basic idea of a biodiversity, <coughs> does everyone know what a carbon credit is? I mean, the general idea is if you prove that you can have a technology or you know a, a nature project that sequesters carbon, that you get a certificate that proves that you have caused this additional sequestration. The same is true for biodiversity credits generally. Um, carbon markets have gotten under fire because for basically 30 years, nobody has really looked properly. And so there have been a lot of carbon cowboys that <laughs> did fraudulent projects and, and people started looking, it's like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And really nothing um, in many cases. But about 20% of the carbon market is very robust, very important. 
and moving uh, to solidify. The biodiversity credits, the, I think they're going to work best in what is the spectrum of uh, restoration. Mm -hmm. So if you have land that has they've been degraded, so call it like really n no intact nature left, it's been destroyed, and you're now bringing back uh, nature in some meaningful form, there I see a very powerful application mm -hmm. of biodiversity credits where far whether it's farmers, agroforestry, um, all these kinds of projects where you see terrible land converted into something much, much better to get additional sources of funding mm -hmm. for, for those projects. That I see an application there. Which I think is exciting yeah. because where you think about not having enough protected areas or space for wildlife and the need to expand, then hopefully there's degraded farmland that you can restore and bring back and expand those protected areas. Yeah, because right now um, ecological restoration is funded by things like philanthropic donations, private grants, sometimes government grants and funding, but there's not much funding for it out there mm -hmm. currently. And I was just going to say as well, it's not just tra tree planting, which is yes. really frustrating. There's so many <laughs> non-indigenous <laughs> trees to plant trees, and there's good ones and less good ones. Or but planting just the ones that sequester a ton of carbon. Exactly. That, that would be in conflict biodiversity. with biodiversity protection. Yes. So there's, yeah, there's <laughs> other p types of restoration needed than just tree planting. And I think we're I want to give time for Q&A, but so as we wrap up the panel, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody. But what are your parting kind of words on the most important take home or, you know, solution that you want to talk about or felt tonight in terms of reversing biodiversity loss? Sure. Um, I keep coming back to the term paradigm shift, and this is something that we talk a lot about in, in our classes. and. You know, we say that we need a fundamental change in how we view nature in order for these problems to really be solved. And that can feel really intimidating and really overwhelming because it's like, oh, really, we have to wait for a paradigm shift before <laughs> any of this can happen. But it is these actions, these nature positive actions that cause the paradigm to shift, right? You don't have to wait for it to happen. You contribute to it happening through incorporating um, nature-based metrics and measurements and risk assessments into businesses and supply chains through funneling finance to to nature conservation through things like storytelling you know we need everybody on board is, is another message we need the storytellers the artists to change the narrative about our relationship with nature we need obviously we need the scientists right we have job security in, in this context um, you need the educators you need the business leaders you need the policy makers you really need everybody um, which is great because there's a job for everyone <laughs> in this field. Um, but yeah, just everybody contributing to the paradigm shift, be part of the transition, be part of, be at the forefront there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would just like to say again, yeah, just everything is connected. Think of mm -hmm. all the connections and to back up something you said earlier about all, not just biodiverse systems, but all systems, right? I mean, the more diverse systems are, the more resilient they're going to be. We know redundancy is a good thing. And so that absolutely holds true for, for ecosystems as well. And thinking of connections and the basically all things that help conserve, restore biodiversity are also going to help with the climate crisis. Not always true going the other way, like planting trees. So making sure that as we are focusing more on things like ecosystem services, making sure we're not looking at things in isolation, that we continue to think about connections, that we don't just think, oh, we can restore it by planting a lot, just a monoculture of eucalyptus. That's going to sequester some carbon, but is it going to, how is it going to affect all the other ecosystem services? So that's why we ran into trouble with maximum sustainable yield, just focusing on one target fish Oh, and all the population somehow crashed because we didn't think of all of the system connections. Um, yeah, just I, in the context of this conversation, I have to say just policy certainty um, and to, to really provide that incentivizing policy that will galvanize action from all actors of society. 
Um, I really like the point you just made in terms of everyone needing to be a part of the discussion, everyone needing to be um, part of the negotiations and part of, therefore also part of the solution, right? All actors of society. And certainly private sector is part of that. Um, and again, from, from a business perspective, what our members really are seeking is indeed policy clarity mm -hmm. uh, and clear incentives on what to pay attention to and what to do. Uh, there is clearly a very strong will out there to do the right thing and to contribute in meaningful ways. Um, again, we've already mentioned it here tonight many times, but at this point it truly is business critical. Uh, it's not a nice to have, it's something that will be part of and already is part of um, what will be the new way to just, there will be the new business as usual, uh, to actually consider climate impacts, to consider biodiversity impacts, uh, and for that to be a part of all business decisions. But again, to facilitate that, there needs to be strong policy frameworks that really incentivize action. Because as private sector, we look towards governments um, to, to tell us a bit where to do and what to operate and how to operate. And that's really what, what we're following in terms of the more broader international negotiations as well. I also think it's worth mentioning, again, looking towards the GBF specifically, there truly is a target for, I would dare to say, everything. And everything we've talked about here tonight, there's a target for everything. Um, you mentioned genetic resources. That is actually target 13, mm -hmm. and that is access and benefit sharing and digital sequencing information. So that is really the equitable and fair sharing of the benefits arising from basically the genetics of biodiversity, right? So the U.S. is definitely going to sign on. <laughs> I have no comment there. But um, so again, also to your point, though, it is very challenging. And that's also, I would urge everyone to, to really recognize how complex it is to get it right from a policy perspective. There's a lot of considerations, specifically if we're thinking ABS and DSI, certainly severe uh, IP considerations come into play. So it's far more complex than what it might seem but there's a lot of will to get it right. There's a lot of will to get it right. And I think especially this master's program, sustainability management, certainly deals with those exact questions um, and thinking about how we'll tackle that because it will be critically needed in the future and it already is critically needed. But takeaway message really is policy certainty and to not always think that um, more is better. Um, again, tying it back to the reporting, for example, if you're swamped with reporting requirements, where will, you, where will there be funding and even capacity to focus on the actual implementation? Um, so there's a lot of angles, a lot of complexities to consider. Yep, so I have uh, maybe just three quick, quick points I wanna leave you with. The first one, I hope I already made, but you know, think about rainforests. I think they are really incredibly important. I want you to leave the room and, and, and make sure that you built that somehow into your day-to-day. -day. Uh, complex systems of enormous magnitude and enormous importance. So if you spend a few minutes just researching the Amazon, it's an incredible system that I have no idea how it is you know, abandoned to the, the kind of global backyards. The second point is be critical. Don't just repeat everything you read quickly. I think I learned this the hard way in the carbon markets. There became sort of this, you know, it became the cool thing at coffee chats to bash the carbon markets. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone has really thought through more than even 10 seconds the real world impact that's having. Like it has for a few months shut down the carbon market. Many, many projects that were really good and the only, you know, kind of like a lifeline to a lot of conservation projects or restoration projects gone just because it was the cool thing at the coffee chat. And that continues and will continue the way we think about electric vehicles versus regular you know, carbon emitting cars. There is a lot of stuff that we as a species need to learn in order to reduce emissions and stop biodiversity loss. And we really need to get a lot smarter about it. And the third piece, is get involved. Uh, you guys are here, I suspect most of you are students. I, for my part, sometimes have a really hard time believing how I am the guy that runs around Davos and Co-op, <laughs> gets to talk to the finance people, the indigenous people. I've made it my job because it's my passion. If you have that passion, go out and, and do it. Get active. 
your solutions are really badly needed. Uh, it's not like somebody else is gonna do it. Um, sometimes I'm really surprised, how is nobody doing anything in this space? There's a lot of need for maybe cross-pollination. Uh, in the nature space, for example, we're missing a lot of capital markets thinking, market, you know, people who are free market and understand uh, the kind of general business. We need those things to blend and we need to blend them really quickly. So long story short, you know, you're in a very exciting space that you get to learn about all these things, but don't assume that then somebody else is already doing it. You will find that nobody's really doing it. So go get active, get involved, do what's, what's fun for you and uh, get in touch if I can ever be helpful. Um, this is also a space where I think we're all helping each other a lot um, as we're trying to figure out solutions and move stuff forward. And I love that. I think it's a great uh, point. And for me, the greatest joy, I used to work in banking too, and I love the fact that I can help now uh, restore you know, a wild place. And a certain many people in the audience feel ecological grief and distress about what's happening to the planet, and to, but to take action is the best antidote. And uh, restoration, rewilding is super hopeful, so um, it is the antidote to the ecological grief that we feel. Um, and, and it's also super important, so we can stop this crisis and return to kind of a livable planet. Um, so, yeah, my, to end, we have like uh, 10 minutes for, for questions, but I just wanted to add that um, as Jenna, similar to Jenna, Jane Goodall, a primatologist, um, had said that we, it is so strange, we as the most intellectual of all species are destroying our own home. So we really need to live up to our scientific name, which is Homo sapiens, the wise ape. Um, and I think together, as you've heard from the panel, that with science, technology, policy, um, great scientists, hope, listening to traditional knowledge, respecting um, other species with compassion, that we can all give the best of each of us to protect wildlife and people and restore, protect and restore wild places. And I really believe that together, most of the damage was done in the last 50 years, so that in a way gives me hope that we can reverse it and begin, uh, create a nature positive world, a regenerative world. So with that, uh, I'd love to open up for questions we have around, 10 minutes. So I'm standing in the way between us and drinks. So uh, can who has the question here? Hi, everyone. I am Chandler Precht. I am one of the directors for our sustainability management and science programs. As Wendy said, we're now jumping into Q&A. Um, but first off, I do want to thank our panelists and moderator. You all are phenomenal. So thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will come to you with a mic. But I have a question, and that is, you all gave some great solutions and great ideas. Um, so I wanna know, do you think we're gonna solve this crisis? Yes. We I have think we to. have no choice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to give the extended version of that, but yes, we have to, right? I think, no, uh, but I think the good news is that humanity is incredibly good at mobilizing when the issue is apparent. The problem we're now facing is we're trying to stop biodiversity loss before we feel all the impacts of it. If we lose the rainforest, life on Earth is going to be significantly worse for all of us, um, if even uh, possible. Um, and so I think a lot of these issues always relate to, we know it's going to happen. We have the global agreements in place, we know the clamp is coming, we need to go and decarbonize and stop biodiversity loss. And we know that, that you know, there's a straight line to making that happen, but we need to happen not with a straight line. We need to have, make it happen as quickly as possible before the pain is there. So the, one of the biggest questions to ask is sort of how do we front load action? How do we front load things that are really hard to finance but should receive financing now. So I think it's a really good question, but uh, absolutely it will get done. It's just a question of how soon. Mm -hmm. We have the knowledge, we have the scientific knowledge of what to do, it's just we need the socio-political will to actually do it. Science communication. Go into yeah. communication. It's the storytellers. No, yeah, I, the storytellers, <laughs> exactly. No, I, I fully agree, like, yes, we, we are gonna solve it. It does occasionally feel a bit discouraging because, again, especially in the policy space, it's so slow moving. 
but we are going to solve it. And to your point, saying that we need to move beyond just a slow linear growth, so then the opposite would be exponential growth. And there truly, I encourage everyone in here especially to look at the really exciting tech developments happening. Um, even how AI and other advanced technologies are being applied to both biodiversity loss but also climate change. Um, so yes, we will solve it, we have to. And I think the news tends to tell bad stories, but there's lots of great, positive, hopeful stories out Absolutely. there about nature. Like one that I think about recently is in Florida, the, the Florida panther. I mean, talk about a species against all odds in a massively urbanizing um, landscape with no space to move, and they need to be able to move to, to remain genetically viable. And you know, there's not many political issues in America that actually all get agreed upon. And they, they passed in Florida um, the Florida Wildlife Corridor Act unanimously. And that came with $2 billion of funding to, to buy land or create space for the Panthers to make their way and, and have a chance at survival in Florida. So there's these great stories out there. I think they don't get told. I mean, we see it at our work at Wild Tomorrow. Nothing makes my heart beat faster than seeing a baby zebra, you know, or a giraffe, a baby giraffe born on land that was degraded farmland. You know, it's, it's really, and I, and I think those stories are important, that it's possible to see, like, and experience the hope of restoration and um, to see what, nature is super resilient. So if you give it space and time and protect it and remove alien plants, it will rebound and, you know, we can have hope that it will restore. Thank you for the panel. Uh, I love the line of like, we don't have the time and we don't have the money to spend. Uh, I have a question regarding the carbon credit and the biodiversity credit for the panel. Uh, we know like for the carbon credit, we need to like go down by the carbon emissions by 2030, like 40, 50% to go net zero. And for the biodiversity COP15, we agreed on like 30 by 30. And we know how to achieve like, like to have like nature-based solutions to need to be brought into effect to bring down, to bring the achieve net zero emissions, right? How, my question is like, how, if we have not already, club the, club the efforts together to meet those two targets? Great question. I think one of the kind of founding or uh, insights or, or observations that I think connect the two topics is life on Earth is carbon-based. So where you have thriving biodiversity, you typically see accumulations of carbon in the form of star storage and continuous sequestration. Healthy ecosystems suck back carbon mm -hmm. and store it. That's the cleanest connect I've found for a rainforest that obviously helps us in a very beautiful way because we can say, well, this is a rainforest, it's a forest, it stores carbon, but it also happens to be home of, again, 50% of the world's living things. And so one of the powerful things that allows me to spare some of the complicated discussions around offsetting in biodiversity space is we plan to utilize carbon credits to protect forests, which are home to biodiversity. What is very complicated is if you start offsetting with biodiversity credits, because biodiversity, unlike carbon, cannot be brought back. So, you know, if we pollute too much carbon, which we already have, we can bring it back. Mm -hmm. But if we destroy a species, let alone 40,000 of them, we cannot regrow some plot of land called now, you know, in a, in a <laughs> sloppy way, biodiversity restoration. It's really bringing back more living space, more habitat, but we cannot bring lost species back. So that's kind of like an important distinction. And I always see it as like the, it's Project Drawdown has this rain, I call it the rainbow, I don't know if they call it that, but there's, you know, you've got all our emissions on one side going up into the atmosphere, and then nature's on the other side and already absorbing almost 50% of our emissions. So to solve our dual crises of climate change, biodiversity loss, they're inextricably linked. We need to, yes, reduce emissions, but also make sure nature as a sink is not degraded further or actually even increased. And then we can get to a place where we can draw down carbon from the atmosphere and start to reverse climate change, which is something kind of that was somewhat, like there used to be a thought that climate change was sort of baked in and had this huge momentum and that it, it's, it is actually kind of newer to science. It was a 
IPCC report a few years ago that said we can reverse climate change and that is the point of drawdown where we reduce our emissions and make sure nature can remain as a sink for to, to get to a point where we start to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and, and then we can re, um, start to reverse the impacts of climate change so they're they're like a rainbow <laughs> actually maybe sorry just want to add one more thing because maybe this is also something that I went through and struggled with um, there's now this like big trend for everything technology, fintech this, technology that. And I think uh, I've come to sort of a move from my passion for nature and species to you know, finance on the other side. And somewhere in between was the discovery that nature does things that humanity is nowhere near close to being able to do. And that's really cool. Like if you see nature as technology that we would ideally be able to try to replicate, you'll find a hard wall. We cannot do it nearly closely enough. So uh, there's uh, obviously now projects, can we invent technology that sucks back carbon? <laughs> and that technology has been around and tested with and tried for, for almost 50 years now. With billions of dollars drowned, the technology has not become meaningfully more efficient. Mm -hmm. And it is at $1,000 per ton. A tree farm, a bland tree farm, which we don't want anymore. We want kind of biodiversity filled tree farms with lots of different species, but they can do it at a fraction of that, maybe $30, $50. Intact Nature does it at somewhere around $13. And so just $13 on one end, nature sequestration, and then a thousand plus uh, dollars per ton if we try to do it ourselves. And mm -hmm. we cannot scale that thing fast enough. It's really. How do we get to scale? That's the, the meaningful problem. Mm -hmm. Intact, old growth, tropical rainforest exactly. is the best sequester of carbon, more so than your, your eucalyptus monoculture. Yep. Wetlands, too. And wetlands. <laughs> I haven't even talked about all the ecosystem services and wetlands. Soil, yes. Um, thank you so much to the panelists. Your insight is super valuable. Um, I was curious, we were talking about biodiversity credits and how they're up and coming. And we clearly have learned a lot of lessons from the carbon credit uh, sphere. So looking at um, criticisms that carbon credits have received, particularly with conflicts of interests and corporations that are polluting, also buying carbon credits, how can we take kind of that insight and apply it to biodiversity credits so that they don't suffer the huge drop in prices that carbon credits are happening, suffering right now? Sorry, I have views on everything, yeah, so oh, it's great. you need Please. to override me. <laughs> I cannot stop talking. Um, so I think, look, as I said earlier, I think the issue in the carbon market is largely that it used to be ungoverned land. Uh, people got into this space, you really had to do almost nothing, submitted some fake evidence to some third party institution and nobody really looked. And the few companies that wanted to be seen doing something then used those you know, you know, half-baked credits to, to look good. We are decisively departed from that history. I think you're seeing a, a global movement to uh, create integrity in the space. There's extremely smart people uh, involved in setting standards and, and setting this all up. So I don't really, my concern actually swings the other way. I think we're trying to perfect the credit creation process. Uh, versus actually allowing projects to go forward and prove out that they are high integrity and really solid projects. Um, and so I think, yeah, as we move forward with biodiversity credits, again, I think I see most of the power of their application in degraded land and, and restoration, which decisively separate from conserving what's intact, especially old growth rainforests. But, um, but yeah, there I think you know, the industry has learned from those ailing problems of the carbon markets. And there are very smart people involved who are setting up really good projects with solid measurement sensors, supervisions, and, uh, and, and also most of the time sound, uh, biologically sound uh, techniques. Yeah, I can just add to that and say that truly the key point is high integrity carbon markets and mm -hmm. high integrity credits, because um, that is what everyone wants, including the buyers, including the corporations. So high integrity and in having that assurance to know that you're actually purchasing high quality verified credits. That's really the key. And it is going to be very, very challenging because carbon credits, there are 
just a few greenhouse gases. <laughs> you measure them, you know exactly how much they are, how much is being taken down. Biodiversity, like what did I just say biodiversity was, right? How do you measure that? So there are, there are gonna be very narrow definitions of what are being measured. And it is gonna be difficult, that is to say, that shouldn't stop us from TNFD reporting and all this. I mean, we have a very good idea of what the drivers of biodiversity loss are. So the fact that it is challenging to measure, to quantify the different types of biodiversity shouldn't stop us. I think we're at drink time. I'm just gonna say with biodiversity credits, I think it's really important to think about who's benefiting and making sure that it's done well and that yes. the people on the ground, especially the protectors of the forest and the indigenous communities benefit um, and I think whose values are and we who's, using? Yeah, and make sure that it's fair. Uh, with that, I think it's time to network. So thank you all again, and thank you to the panel for this really thank great you. discussion. Thank you. Thank you.